Well, good afternoon and welcome to Roosevelt University's fifth annual American Dream Reconsidered Conference. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format, the first for all of us. We appreciate your continued support of this conference, and I would like to once again give a special thanks to our sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois and Huntington Bank. This year's conference, which is organized around the theme of Eleanor Roosevelt's American Dream, occurs at a difficult moment in America. The country is facing multiple crises, including an ongoing pandemic and that has done irreparable harm to families and communities across the nation. And of course, a summer of protests that have shined a light on America's shameful record of racial discrimination. These events may make us wonder whether Eleanor Roosevelt's vision of an American dream rooted in the power of ordinary citizens to govern themselves has permanently disappeared from view. She would not want us to despair. These crises have allowed us to see the kindness in people and the sense of community forged as individuals and groups help one another through these dire times. As Roosevelt University celebrates its 75th anniversary, we are reminded of the university's duty to foster a sense of community and civic duty. Founded in the spirit of social justice and named after Franklin and Eleanor, Roosevelt University must continue to push for inclusion, equality, and justice for all. This conference is one way that we continue and contribute to that mission. We start this year's conference with a panel of hope, 21st century New Deal political leadership, which serves as this year's Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture sponsored by the Center for New Deal Studies at Roosevelt University. It begins an exciting week of conversation that we hope will inspire all of us and engage us as we roll up our sleeves to begin another 75 years of social justice work. So now I invite Dr. Margaret Rung, Professor of History and Director of the Center for New Deal Studies to the screen. She will say a few words about the session and introduce our moderator. So thank you again for being with us for this important conversation. Thank you, President Ali. Thank you everyone for joining us for the 27th Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture. The Center for New Deal Studies is honored to sponsor this lecture as the opening event of the American Dream Reconsidered Conference. On the 25th anniversary of its founding, the Center for New Deal Studies continues to preserve and foster the legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and their New Deal. I'd like to thank the Center's Advisory Board for its support. Thank you so much. Additionally, please indulge me as I offer a few words of thanks to the individuals responsible for this conference. As the co-chair, along with Professor Andrew Trees of the Program Committee, I would like to acknowledge our team's hard work. Technical wizards, Deanna Lee and Zachary Phelps, along with Creative Director, Amanda De Palma, put in untold hours organizing the logistics of these sessions. Thanks as well to Michael Ford, Jared Fritz McCarty, Kathy Blitz, Katora Brown, Mike Kaluzny, and Vanessa George for your contributions. As always, Julie Rowan in the Dean's office deserves special thanks. Finally, a shout out to my comrades at the Progressive News Magazine in these times, who have introduced me to so many inspiring social movements and individuals, including today's speaker, 
Mayor Chokwe Antar Lumbamba of Jackson, Mississippi. President Ali spoke so beautifully about ER's dream that I will not elaborate much on it. In thinking about progressive politics and what needs to be done today, I'm heartened by Eleanor Roosevelt's biography. ER was not static. Her views and activities evolved over time. She listened, reflected, and shifted her thinking. She was open-minded. To me, that's a necessary ingredient to being an effective progressive. It does not simply mean reacting to social injustice, although that's critical, of course. Being progressive means having a vision of something different, something other than the status quo. Being a progressive means being a hero to some and a thorn in the side to others. As one publisher said of Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor was, quote, the best loved woman in the world. No woman has ever so comforted the distressed or distressed the comfortable. Two brief examples of progressivism, both tied to ER, illustrate this point. One was the founding of the Highlander Folk School in 1932 by Miles Horton. Established as a worker education center, Highlander trained ordinary people in labor organizing before then quickly pivoting to working on civil rights as it recognized the intersection between these two critical movements. What's important to know about Highlander is that it was founded in Mount Eagle, Tennessee in Grundy County, one of the poorest counties of Tennessee. At the height of the Jim Crow era, a white Southerner founded a progressive interracial institution in the heart of the South. Deeply impressed by their work, ER traveled to Highlander in the 1950s, driving there on isolated county roads, even though she knew that the Grundy County KKK had offered a $25,000 bounty to anyone who kidnapped her. Highlander pushed for an American dream that was not yet a reality. Roosevelt University celebrating its 75th anniversary is another example of breaking the mold of doing something different in spite of the challenges ahead. As we will learn in Tuesday night's session on the history of the university, Roosevelt faculty, staff, and students took a bold and risky move when they walked out of the Central YMCA College in protest against impending racial and ethnic quotas. Today's speaker is yet another example of this effort to envision something different for this nation. Mayor Lumbumba's faith, deep faith in a government by the people and willingness to experiment with new forms of democratic governance in a state not well known for its progressive politics should inspire all of us. As stewards of Roosevelt University, we must play an active role in the reconstruction of the American dream. This institution has never shied away from standing up for what is right. We cannot fear the consequences of our actions. We can only rest assured that our commitment to social justice puts us on the right side of history, which is where we have always been and where we should always remain. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, my esteemed colleague, David Ferris, Associate Professor of Political Science. Professor Ferris is the author of several books, including the very recently published, The Kids Are All Left, and pens a regular column on American politics in the news magazine, The Week. For the last several years, many of us have clung to David's beautifully crafted essays and incisive analysis as a means of coping in these challenging times. David will introduce our speaker, so I turn the screen over to him, and thank you. Well, thank you, Margie, for that um, very, very kind introduction. And uh, uh, thank you also to President Ali and to my colleagues and the organizer of this, uh, of this conference for the for the great privilege of moderating this discussion. Um, and of course, most of all, thank you to our distinguished guest for taking the time out of running a, a major American metropolis during a massive ongoing crisis <laughs> to speak to us today. Um, and it is my pleasure, uh, my great pleasure, to introduce you to Chokwe Antar Lumumba, the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. I really encourage you to go onto our website and read um, his full biography, which is really fascinating and inspiring. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut to the chase here um, and say that in 2017, he defeated nine other candidates in the Democratic primary for mayor with a total of 55% of the vote. He went on to win the city's general election by 93%. And as mayor, 
He was recognized as one of Mississippi's top 50 most influential leaders and was named one of the 100 most influential African-Americans of 2017 by The Root. In February 2019, Mayor Lumumba received the Frederick Douglass 200 Award in the area of politics, an honor bestowed upon him by Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University in Washington, DC. Um, and I'm sure that you will uh, agree with me by the end of this panel that he is really um, a visionary mayor in public policy. Um, and uh, we can't wait to see what the future holds. Um, so welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming him to our panel. Thank, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, I share the sentiments of, of thanking President Ali, uh, the faculty and staff at Roosevelt University, and it's absolutely a pleasure to be speaking with you uh, and, and to uh, allow this discussion to go forward with your listening audience. Great. Um, well, uh, I can't wait to get this conversation started, so um, <laughs> let's just let's dive right on in. Um, when you were um, elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, you, you talked about making the city uh, the most radical city on the planet. Um, and I think many people in our audience are really eager to hear about some of the initiatives that you've undertaken in Jackson as part of that vision um, and, and what the outcome of those efforts has been so far. Absolutely. Uh, well, let me let me begin where where that that uh, phrase or, or where that that mantra actually started from. Uh, when I was running for office and, and uh, this idea surfaced after many years of community activism with my family and organization that I'm a part of, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, which ultimately led to my father running for office. Uh, when he was running, uh, as was echoed when I ran, uh, it was suggested that possibly to see uh, the progress that our city needed. Uh, and so I looked up the word radical and I found that a radical is a person who seeks change. And if we look outside of you know, the walls in which we, we currently are sitting, if we look into communities uh, that are going through cycles of humiliation, uh, communities that, that are in need of change, then the reality is that we need to be as radical as the circumstances dictate we should be. And so we've formed this concept, this idea of building a dignity economy, an economy which focuses on the inherent dignity of every person. Uh, and, and when you're trying to build a new economy, then ultimately you have to do so with the surplus of people that have been cast away by the old economy. Uh, returning citizens, uh, people who uh, have not had a fair shake or, or an equitable distribution of resources. And so all of our initiatives are focused in that way. How we build our city and what we fund, we feel is, is an exercise of collective genius. And so we have people's assemblies where we meet quarterly across the city uh, we discuss major issues to talk about uh, what is what is necessary, what we're seeing from in government, what the community may be seeing on the streets. And it serves as a pressure initiative uh, to ensure that those that are elected in leadership are holding true to the values and the desires of the people that put them in office. And so ultimately, what we want to do uh, is turn the way we see electoral politics on its head, no longer subscribing to the notion that someone stresses their political ambition, gives us their agenda for how they're going to change our lives, only to find that neither them, uh, neither they're, they're neither able to achieve that, nor do they speak to the true interest of the people. And so we believe in a model where the community drafts its own agenda, drafts the leadership which represents that agenda and moves it forward and that the pressure is on uh, from day one uh, through the execution of those initiatives. Thank you for that. Um, I, I just maybe just follow up really quick um, about this idea of the people's assemblies. I think this is something um, that's particularly fascinating to me. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on sort of your relationship to those assemblies and the relationship of the assemblies to like the city legislature and, and to your office and um, sort of what, you know, what has been tangibly changed in the city um, because of this new energy that, that you're bringing out from the citizens. Absolutely. So the People's Assemblies actually started, I, I want to say, roughly around 2008 or so uh, when uh, my father ran for city council initially. Uh, and out of those assemblies, uh, we began to bring issues to bear uh, that were affecting the community. And so we, we would visit, uh, honestly, we would go between community centers and, and churches throughout that ward at that time uh, in order to hear what the people's voice was. Uh, and it has led to the, the support of certain people running for office 
It has led to, you know, uh, direct action at City Hall. It has led to all kinds of policy change within the city. It led to an anti-racial profiling ordinance uh, that has now landed us on, you know, uh, the sanctuary city list. And, and we're proud uh, that we have taken that stand and continue to do so. Uh, more recently, we've utilized the People's Assemblies as a means of education back and forth, uh, an information exchange where we've explained various components of the budget uh, in our political activism, we have to be certain that we have political education as well and understand how these systems, which we have historically been locked out of, we need to understand that they work. Not so much to subscribe to them, but if we really want to see change in them, we have to understand how they operate. And so we've been able to educate on the function of the budget, and then we've been able to start a participatory budgeting process. Uh, the vision there is that we believe that a budget is a moral document. It speaks to the values of our community. Uh, and we ultimately want to make certain that we are not scratching where people are not itching. Uh, there are a number of other things that we have begun to champion from within the People's Assemblies, like the idea of cooperative enterprise. Uh, Jackson is like many communities which the demographics reflect our city, uh, which have seen white flight, has seen uh, redlining, uh, has seen a complete divestment uh, from our city. And so we believe that the, the means by which we make our city profitable, the reason, the means by which we uh, create job opportunities isn't just a measure of, of you know, incentivizing every, every valuable thing we have as a city, nor is it a means of just saying that we're good people and we want you to come. We feel that we have to leverage our position. And so by showing and demonstrating that we have an ability to fill our voids, what we believe is that ultimately it makes it dangerous not to invest in the largest city in our state uh, by a factor of three. And so we're trying to leverage our position, execute a means of self-determination, which ultimately uh, leads to, to other investment taking place that we, that we desire. And we wanna be a business friendly city, but it has to be a reciprocal re relationship whereby people not only turn profit, but they invest back in our community. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I was hoping um, you could maybe just elaborate just a little bit more on participatory budgeting. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a buzz phrase that we hear a lot, um, but I wonder whether our audience really understands how it works, yeah. um, and uh, how you get people to how do you get people to do it to find the time to to be there for it. So we through the uh, People's Advocacy Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, has done marketing to of the People's Assemblies literally on, on radio and, and uh, through text message, uh, have informed people about the different assemblies that are taking place. And we started at a very basic level. We, we literally created our own monopoly game as a city uh, that, that really described what the budget uh, restrictions were, how much the budget was for the city, uh, so that people could understand what are uh, what are what is money that is provided by grants? What are the restrictions on those funds? What is the difference between general fund and enterprise fund? And what it enables us to do and what restrictions are there? Out of that, uh, the community uh, developed a set of priorities, things that they wanted to see out of the administration, things that they wanted to see injected into the budget. And then they came to the, uh, the budget hearing and, and spoke to those. Now, what we understand is three minutes on a microphone does not equal community participation. And that's why we thought it, necess it necessitated a longer uh, and protracted uh, process by which the community could, could gain understanding and the community could also uh, educate us in terms of what they needed. Ultimately, uh, what you don't want to do is scratch where people aren't itching. And you want to make certain that you're fulfilling the ends that, that best uh, change people's quality of life. I, I would I would say this. Uh, you, you do hear about participatory budgeting models. And we had some uh, some representatives from other cities around the country come and speak about their process. But I think that is important that as you build that process, that it is not done in a cookie cutter fashion, but that it speaks specific to the culture of your city and the needs of your city. Great. Thank you. Um, so one thing I wanted to dive into a little bit. Um, so Mississippi is a state with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature and two Republican senators and three out of four Republican members of the House. Um, and so I was wondering, maybe what are some of the sort of unique challenges posed by trying to create this more progressive city while embedded in a very different power structure, one that might be 
you know, somewhat hostile to what you are trying to build there? And how does local government make a difference in, in the lived experience of people's lives um, when the state um, is, is controlled by very sort of different people? Absolutely. So, you know, David, that, that really requires on the execution of some task uh, that, that we bring to the table uh, a discussion which is framed in the, the sense of operational unity. What I mean by that is, is that it is focused on what our common ends and objectives are rather than our differences. With that being said, and I can talk about, you know, the practical execution of that. When I was less than a month into office, uh, we were faced with the threat of a school district takeover, uh, which is 97% African-American uh, and was threatened to be run by a state that does not reflect the children uh, nor the parents that, that make up the district. Uh, and we were able uh, to ascertain that that the governor at that time felt stretched. Uh, on one hand, uh, you know, he he felt that the district was in need of of correction and change, which I can agree to that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, he felt that that you know uh, that that state uh, takeovers had not been successful uh, in the past, not only in the state of Mississippi, but nationwide. Uh, furthermore. Uh, there were some investments that some of his friends had made in some housing in the area. And I was able to point to him that, that a school district being taken over is not advantageous to that. And so ultimately, from that discussion, we drafted, uh, meaning my office and, and uh, the, the people within my office, the, 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 you know, the strong and intelligent people that helped me each day, drafted what we called a third way, uh, where we looked at a, a uh, and it, you know, a, a uh, advisory board that could speak to some of the needs. And we knocked on 60,000 doors in the city of Jackson. Uh, we knocked on those doors so that we could talk to community. We could talk to uh, parents. We could talk to neighbors and see what their aspirations were for our di district. And we're able to use that as a framework to build what we are now uh, putting together and, and which has actually led to an, uh, an improved grade of our district. And so we look at operational unity, but the other measure, David, is, is that if your plan for success is dependent on someone else acting on your behalf, then you don't have a plan. What you have is a wish list. And so we understand that. And so the principle which guides our administration each day and which we look for solutions out of is the principle of self-determination. How can we begin to build for ourselves, understanding that we are the Calvary that we've been waiting on? And so we go to community. I believe in the words of Ella Baker, who said that if you look deep into community, you find strength, not weakness. And so that's what we do in order to solve many of the issues that we have. Does that mean that there's a back and forth uh, from time to time with the, the governor or, or those Senate representatives or uh, the, the U.S. attorney for our district, who obviously is running for office of some type? Yes, it does. Uh, but we don't shy away from that. So long as we understand what our values and our desires are as a community, we push forward in that regard. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so Chokwe, as, as you know, as, as President Ali mentioned in his introduction, we are living through um, these these twin crises, right? We have this COVID-19 pandemic on, on one hand, we also have um, a sort of burgeoning national movement for racial justice and to address issues of systemic racism in our society. Um, I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about how you're approaching these issues in the city. What has been the experience of, of leading Jackson through the COVID pandemic and also um, what, what has been happening there and how has your office been responding to um, sort of national movements to, um, you know, for example, to defund the police and, and, and things like that? Absolutely. Well, first I would begin by saying that you know, whether we're talking about the social justice uh, movement, the, the energy that young people are, are uh, generating, I think that we have to concretize that and move it from a mystical and mysterious place and organize it so that we have very uh, specific aims and, and, and uh, requests. Uh, but what we've been able to do, the way that I see that, first, this is what I was going to say, the way that I see that is two sides of, of the same coin. Uh, COVID has not come in order to discriminate against black and brown communities. What COVID is, is uh, demonstrating, what it is exposing, what it is showing a light on, is how we've been missing the mark as a nation to begin. From, to, to begin. Uh, and, and we haven't taken some sudden left turn where 
listening to the mantra of make America great again, uh, where ultimately America hasn't gone wrong as it pertains to race, as it pertains to uh, the lack of equity, as it pertains to discrimination, uh, America has never been right. Uh, and so what I learned about love, what my mother taught me about love, is that you should love someone enough to correct them. Uh, we should love this country enough to be honest about its failures. We should love this nation enough uh, to correct when it is off course. And so uh, we champion that. Uh, as a city, uh, we have come in with very clear aims as it pertains to our police department. Uh, anytime we have an officer involved shooting, uh, we make certain that that person is immediately uh, placed on leave, that the case is immediately sent to the district attorney for review, and they can't come back until a grand jury clears them of those cases. Uh, we are making certain uh, that we that we created an officer ID task force uh, to make certain that that there was a policy in place because the city had none before as it pertained to officer involved shootings and when the officer's uh, identity should be released. Uh, we've created uh, a process by which if a person dies, and I, I think this is the only executive order in the nation of this type, if a person dies at the hands of an officer and in, in an officer involved shooting, whether there was the, the shooting was uh, had merit or not, whether it was justified or not, I should say, that we don't release mugshots. We feel that that is making a person suffer an assassination of their character. And one a person's life should not be summed up in, in one moment uh, on the worst day of their life. Uh, and so we don't release mugshots of those individuals, that if there's an image that needs to be displayed, that there are so many means in 2020 by which you can retrieve those images. Uh, we continue to work with our officer ID task force and we are putting forward and we have talked from day one, long before George Floyd, long before uh, the social activism that we've seen to create a, uh, to create a people's uh, a, 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 a citizens review board that is run by the, the people. Now, one of the limitations we have now is that uh, the state of Mississippi does not allow subpoena power. And so we want our people's review board, our citizen review board to have teeth, to have an ability to gain the documentation that it needs uh, in order to, to make the suggestions uh, or in order to move forward. Also, we believe that our police department must have uh, citizen or, or, or uh, community sensitivity training. That's what we want the uh, review board to also be engaged in, in addition to court watch, to make certain that justice is being dispersed within our court system. Uh, as it pertains to the COVID front, uh, you know, Jackson has been similarly positioned to many cities across the nation where we've been lacking the federal leadership that was necessary. We've been lacking the state leadership that is necessary. And so we've stood up many of the processes to rescue ourselves. Uh, we purchased 12,000 tests on our own. Uh, we made certain that we were able to purchase convalescence rooms uh, so that people who contracted the virus and weren't able uh, to quarantine in a place which was safe and, and would not keep other people uh, away from the harm and threat of the virus uh, from, from being uh, potentially infected, we, we were able to provide hotel rooms that people could go to. We created a symptom tractor so that we could better understand where the virus uh, was spreading, where it was disproportionately spreading in our community. And we have since put on, uh, we have created mobile testing uh, units that we can go out in the community and test those areas. Uh, and so uh, we created a, a hotline for people to call and, and you know if they were experiencing some of the symptoms and be connected to uh, a personal care physician. Uh, we have an officer, I mean, not an officer, we have a, a COVID task force that, that you know, informs us and help us make policy decisions throughout. And we created a warm line. One of the silent killers of COVID-19 are the people who are going through so many socioeconomic struggles, uh, the, the mental health struggles, uh, where there's a rise in domestic violence, where there's a rise in shooting uh, incident, uh, incidents all across the nation. And so we've stood up that warm line so that people could call and talk to either a pastor uh, who, has, who we have used as credible messengers uh, to connect them with clinical psychologists and also social workers. And so we've done you know, uh, our best job to stand up these resources that were never intended for cities to stand up. Uh, but, but once again, 
if our plan is to wait on someone else to act on our behalf, then we don't have a plan. We have a wish list. And so we have stood in the gap in order to support our residents here in the city of Jackson. Can I ask you, I mean, just on a, like on a personal level, what it has been like um, to kind of be bearing the weight of, of you know, having executive authority um, in, in this kind of crisis, um, when so many people are relying on the leadership of your office and, you know, particularly obviously in the absence of that kind of leadership at other. You may have froze on me, David, uh, but if, if I can still be heard, I'll, I'll speak to it. Uh, you know, this is, has been one of the, uh, the greatest uh, challenges that, that I've ever seen. Uh, and, you know, we, we knew that we had struggles that we had to deal with, uh, financial struggles as a city, uh, you know, big fights that we knew we were going to have to take on. But in addition to COVID, uh, only a few months uh, prior to the national recognition of this, this pandemic, uh, we had experienced a 30 year flood. Uh, so we were coming out of one emergency into this national emergency. And so, you know, I was told a long time ago that in this position, the options that I would have would be between a bad decision and a worse decision. Uh, when we're shutting down people's livelihood uh, because we recognize that, that it creates a greater risk of a virus being transferred, uh, that's, you know, choosing between a bad decision and a worse decision. Uh, and in the absence of, of leadership that provides resources to people that are struggling, uh, then, then it leaves us or it forces our hand. It leaves us with very few options. And so, you know, uh, you know, I, I feel that the greatest responsibility that I have as mayor is to protect the, the health and safety of, of the people uh, who trust who entrusted me with this position. And so that is one that I, I hold dearly. Uh, it often leads me into, you know, people being frustrated by, you know, our decision to to uh, shut certain establishments down, uh, to to have a curfew, uh, to stop some of the the uh, private events that are taking place. It has been a really really big challenge. Now, one thing that I am grateful for is that I have a network of of uh, young uh, mayor friends uh, and older mayor friends. Uh, that are experiencing this with me at the same time. We exchange ideas. Uh, we talk about uh, the struggles that we're all experiencing because you know we have to recognize the mental effect that this is having on all of us. Uh, the mental effect that it is having on our children. You know there are some things that we we take for granted, and and you know it's a matter of privilege. We tell our communities that we need them to socially distance. But if you live in a, a housing tenement, if you live um, if you live in, in communal living, then what does social distancing look like to you? And so this this has really shown a light on on where we're missing the mark as a nation. I know I'm running on on this, David, but but there was one other thing that I, that I wanted to mention that we've done. In the midst of COVID, we've been in our budget discussions and just last week we passed our budget. Uh, and in recognizing the health challenges uh, that people are suffering from, we voted and we passed a budget that will cover 100% of the insurance premiums of all city employees. Um, I feel that if if voting rights was the battle of the 20th century, then the right to health care is the battle of the 21st. And so uh, I'm really, really excited about that. And hopefully it serves as a model for a lot of the private enterprise in our city. Well, speaking only for myself, I, I could listen to you run on about this for some time. So, um, but uh, you mentioned actually, um, <laughs> You mentioned climate change uh, very briefly in your answer, and um, I know it's you know it's hurricane season, and in your region in particular is vulnerable um, to so many of the impacts that we're going to see from climate change. And I know, particularly many of the young members of our audience today are are eager to hear from from leaders who um, who have some ideas about what to do uh, to mitigate those effects. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, you know what can be done on a local level? You know, I mean, it's, it's mostly talk about national politics, right? But like, how can cities and how can municipalities sort of do their part um, to, it feels like COVID is like a dry run for climate change, right? Um, it's like an instant climate change. And so what, what does our future look like and what is your role in that? Absolutely. Well, uh, we have a goal to be carbon neutral, uh, you know, by, by the shortest distance that we can. And we're trying to pass that 
uh, for the council, but we're also working with the National League of Cities to do a, a heat uh, mapping of our city. Uh, we understand that as climate, uh, climate change is occurring, that there are certain areas where we want to grid, even when in our city, what that looks like and how we create cooling centers uh, for people across the city. Uh, we're dealing with more extreme conditions. That's what led to our 30 year flood. Uh, that is what is leading to these things taking place across the city. I'm a part of a group of mayors uh, that, that, uh, that are all subscribing and pushing forward to climate change uh, resolve. Uh, and and I'm forgetting the name of the, name of the group, forgive me. Uh, I think it's the, the, uh, the number 50 stands out to me. Uh, but, you know, we have signed on to uh, this initiative to see the federal government uh, take a more proactive stance, because if we don't, we, we live in interconnected communities. Jackson in and of itself can't solve the issue of climate change. You can't solve it in New York by yourself. This requires that we all be in lockstep with one another. And the notion that climate change, climate change is not a reality, the notion uh, that it is some manufactured idea uh, is, is being defeated by the facts and the reality of what we're seeing each and every day. Uh, we're seeing uh, hotter, we're seeing more extreme weather conditions uh, on, on each end of the calendar. Uh, we're seeing uh, more storms. We're seeing, you know, harsher effects in our environment. And so uh, we have to choose to, to recognize this and mitigate that challenge. And so uh, cities have a responsibility to educate. Uh, it is those people that, that are most impoverished uh, that will suffer the, the worst effects, that will be, you know, most ill prepared um, to protect themselves and protect their families. So that's why we think that this heat mapping across our city is, is critically important. Uh, we have an elderly population that as we deal with extreme Mississippi heat, uh, increased humidity, uh, that they will be the, uh, the ones that will be affected the worst. Great. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question um, and then I think we're gonna open it up to some, some audience Q&A. Um, but uh, so the, the late Mario Cuomo said that you, uh, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Um, and I, I was wondering um, if there's anything that you, you know, you really wanted to do before you got into office. And then when you got into office and you were confronted, I guess, with some of the realities and the challenges of that thing, that it made it maybe less possible to pursue the kind of change that you had, had dreamed of pursuing. Well, well, I'll say I'll say a couple of things uh, about that, David. So, you know, one, I had the benefit of watching my father take office before before I was blessed to hold this office. And what we learned, uh, we've been a part of different initiatives, whether it's against police brutality, you know, whether it's about economic justice, you know, uh, over the years, we, we've been a part of struggle, we've been a part of organizing. Uh, what he learned once he won office is that he had, he had, uh, that we hadn't won like that before. And so it was kind of an Oh, oh, crap! Moment, uh, you know. Let let. What are the things that that are our limitations, and what can't we do? Ultimately, what we have to understand is that uh, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, and that means that there are structural confines to government that that don't necessarily lend itself to changing everything that community needs to see, and so that's why we believe that we have to have a comprehensive struggle, a comprehensive uh, approach to the struggle. Uh, where if you have an administration which is friendly to a people's assembly, which is friendly and, and, and um, is accepting of the ideas of the community and working with the community, that is good. Uh, but at the same time, just as we're seeing in the streets right now, if we didn't have people demonstrating in Minnesota and demonstrating across the country, then we have to recognize that there would not be uh, the level of recognition that is taking place now about issues of social uh, and racial injustice, right? Uh, and so it requires that pressure on the outside and it requires the work uh, with the community on the inside. Uh, there have been a number of things, um, you know, as we're looking at issues of, of economic justice, as we're looking at issues of, of how we get resources to people, 
uh, as we're looking at our failing infrastructure, uh, there are things that I'm challenged with. One of the things that I'm challenged with is the finances of our city. Uh, prior to taking office, uh, we had a city which was in furloughing our city employees. We had a six million dollar shortfall. Uh, we had employees that had never that hadn't gotten a, a raise in more than a decade. Uh, we had a water uh, metering contract that has that cost ninety million dollars, the richest contract in our city's history. We paid twice as much as three cities three times our size. It was leading to uh, arid water bills where people's water were being cut off, and and you know uh, at a time like this, we certainly recognize the need for water and and uh, the stability and the right to water, and so those are things that. I'm fun, I find myself battling between the resources and the finances of our city and the progressive ends and the progressive desires that we have. And so we're trying to, you know, make certain that we we take care of the city's finances, but don't lose sight of what our overall goals and aspirations are for our community. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's take some let's take some questions from from the audience. Um, I'm, I'm being sent some. So. Um, let me start with a question from Katie on YouTube, and that is, um, what lessons can other progressive candidates, especially in the South, learn from your successful run for office? I think that, you know, one of the things that if, if I can add anything to the discussion, I, I hope so, uh, is that people run true to their values and their principles uh, early on as people intended the idea of radical to be a negative, uh, to be something that I, I that they thought that I would need to push back on. I embraced it um, because ultimately what we learn is that people haven't fallen into the conditions that they're in because someone has been too radical for them, right? Because someone has fought too hard on their behalf. Uh, and so uh, obviously what you do is, you know, you find what, what, you know, issues are, are taking place right where you are uh, and you expand and broaden your horizons as the opportunity exists. Um, and, and so I encourage people to get uh, activated wherever they are. You know, I, I grew up, uh, you know, doing anti-Klan rallies at, at eight years old, right? I, I was in a family that, that believed in the idea of family, believed in the idea of community and believed in the notion of seeing the community as a family. Um, and then lastly, I would leave them with the words of Franz Fanon. Uh, Franz Fanon in his book, Wretched of the Earth, said that each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. And so I think that this is a time, this is a very critical hour where we have to truly understand what the mission of this generation has to be. And I would encourage progressives to be the ones that stand up and, and push the envelope. I read Fanon in grad school. It was a real eye opener. <laughs> um, so there's a question from Kay on Facebook, um, and that is, uh, how have the the various COVID precautions that you've taken um, in Jackson have they have they affected the rate of infection over time in Jackson? And you know, you know, how successful have these efforts been? You said the name was Kay. Kay. Yep. Kay. Kay early on, uh, we were doing an amazing job. Uh, in fact. Uh, we had a, a, um, a lower infection rate than cities of similar size throughout the, con the country. Uh, and then what happened to us is what happened to many mayors across the country, that our governor uh, decided that he wanted to open up business. And so uh, Jackson, like many other cities, is interconnected. We literally have parts of our city where, you know, directly across the street is another city. And so if we are socially distancing, if we are shutting down certain businesses, but people can literally cross the street into another community, which is open up and it puts us on an island. And so our social distancing became more of a notion than a reality. Uh, and so we saw a tremendous spike in the numbers. In fact, we got to the point where Mississippi was being recognized as you know uh, the, the latest uh, ground zero, the latest hotspot uh, in the nation. And so uh, that is directly attributable to us handling this issue from a political stance as opposed to a scientific and practical stance. Uh, you know, I've been faced with a seesawing act of, of shutting certain businesses down and then opening them up because there are no resources for them. Uh, you know, you have to think about the ancillary effects 
uh, that take place, people who are being evicted and crime going up. All of those things have been a real struggle. And that makes this the greatest challenge that I've ever dealt with as mayor. Uh, and I imagine that it's one of the largest challenges that, that most uh, leaders of, of uh, municipalities across the country are facing. Great, thank you. Um, let's take a question from Ellen on Facebook. And that is, um, so what do you recommend to other public officials looking to make systemic change? Like where do you where do they start, um, and when, why do you think other mayors haven't had the courage to do some of the things that you're doing? Well, first and foremost, uh, the decision to make systemic change should come before they are elected in office, right? Uh, if if they are already elected in office and they don't hold a position, you know, uh, to fight for systemic change, uh, then the likelihood that they're going to suddenly change their stripes uh, is, is not great. And so uh, I think that it really starts with the community and identifying or turning, like I said at the beginning of my remarks, you know, uh, changing the entire way that we see electoral politics is the way that we have to begin. Uh, you know, I had no intention of running for mayor. This hasn't been some childhood dream of mine. In fact, I grew up in an environment where we were more antagonistic to electoral politics, doing direct action at City Hall. Uh, making certain that that we organize community in, in you know uh, you know uh, police corruption uh, and and other forms of corruption um, matters, and so ultimately what we learn is that one uh, we had to meet the people where they were. Two, um, we learned that that ultimately uh, we couldn't have a revolutionary elitism that by looking at issues that may seem somewhat mundane, issues which may seem small in the grand scheme of things, that it can be a connector, it can be a leveraging point to have larger discussions. Uh, what I call that is my pothole to pothole analysis. You know, as I decided to run for office, uh, you know, I would go into the streets and tell people, uh, you know, about all the things that I wanted to do. Having a background where both of my parents were activists, I had a propensity to talk about some of the larger things in life, like human rights and self-determination. Uh, and, and so when I would knock on a door, I would invariably be greeted by a brother or sister who say, yeah, that's good, young brother, but uh, how are you gonna fix that pothole in the middle of my street, right? And so ultimately what we have to understand is that we have to be able to connect pothole to pothole and community to community so people in Jackson, Mississippi, understand why there's a community that looks just like theirs in New York, uh, why there's a community that looks just like theirs in Gary, Indiana, or uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, which suffers from the same infrastructure problems that they do. And ultimately what we learned is that the pothole was never our problem in the first place. Uh, the problem is that we don't control the decision-making process that leads to the pothole being fixed. The problem is that we don't control the curriculum that educates our children. The problem is that we don't control the investments that take place in our community. The problem is a fundamental one, that we lack self-determination. And so you need leadership that sees it the way that you see it. Uh, being that I'm in Mississippi, which is 45, about 40 percent uh, black uh, uh, state, you know, at one time our mission was to get leadership that looked like us. Now our mission nationwide is to get leadership that thinks like us. That, yeah, that really, really resonates with me because uh, one of the things that I discuss with my students a lot here at Roosevelt um, is how important it is to get people with that activist background, with those social justice principles, um, into positions of authority like like yours. And I think you you see here um, the real tangible changes that you can make when you when you have those folks in, in those kinds of positions of power. Um, let's take a question from Alandria on Facebook, and that is, um, how do you balance out and seek out um, a mix of views when seeking community input into the governing process? Uh, well, you know, we struggle for, for consensus and that doesn't always happen, uh, but we come into a discussion with the, the principles of unity, debate, unity. I think that we can start a discussion understanding where we see eye to eye. Uh, we can debate where we may have differences with the objective of reaching greater unity at the end of the day than we arrived in. And so that process, uh, by extending um, ourselves or, or lending ourselves to that process, I think it sharpens us, it lends us to necessary critique, 
And then it, it lends us to a better understanding of one another's position. Sincere people can have sincere disagreements and we shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away from what people are telling us and what they're experiencing. Uh, they may have a different vantage point. Uh, ultimately, we may end the discussion, not necessarily siding with their position, uh, but everyone should be heard and, and everyone should bring uh, into the arena uh, what they're experiencing. Great. Um, so it's a question from Mark on Facebook. Um, and that is when you're when you're speaking about the participatory community run boards um, uh, as, as a way to hold accountable our elected leaders um, and to assure the community's needs are being met and respected. Um, and, and what other ways could a community most effectively hold its elected leaders accountable for, for their actions and their policies? Well, one is to vote them out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the one that we, we traditionally know about. Uh, but, you know, there's a need for people to be present at, at certain uh, certain moments. You know, one thing that, that I found disappointing as I came in office, we had to start our participatory budgeting process in our second year. When you come into office, uh, you're typically on the budget of the past administration. And so you can't change the revenue. The numbers are what they are. Uh, in mid-cycle, it's very difficult to to change, you know, where you are putting money. And so, you know, I find it, you know, people come often to City Hall uh, when they have a problem, uh, when it's too late, uh, when they know that things are not being funded the way that they need to be funded. And so I encourage people to, to come throughout that process and be, bear witness to what is taking place. Uh, you know, draft, uh, draft leadership, draft representatives that, that are going to take people's office if they're not doing what they need to do. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's ultimately what it is. It's, it's no secret recipe to it other than to, to be engaged and to be accountable, uh, and understand, you know, I, I ran on a, mo on a model that said, when I become mayor, you become mayor. On one hand, that's because I believe in the collective genius of our community. And that's because I believe in a participatory process. Uh, but also it's, and I believe in, in, uh, in democratizing power, but it's also because I believe that there's a shared responsibility that, that I'm not smart enough as mayor to figure out all of the problems of our city. Uh, I'm, I don't have a team that's gifted enough to figure out all of those solutions on our own. And so it really requires the community lean in and, and you know stay in the process, not just at, at the time of election, but throughout, uh, throughout the term and, and throughout all of the days. Great, thank you. Um, got a question from from Margie. I think you know Margie. <laughs> um, she able and, to ask a question. <laughs> legal, David. <laughs> I think so. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna rule it legal inbounds. <laughs> um, so uh, she asks. Um, I know that you were not anticipating getting into politics, um, and so what um, what inspires you to keep coming in day after day to to do this? You know, this very difficult work. Yeah. Well, well, first and foremost, uh, I love my people. Uh, and as my father would say, if you don't love the people, sooner or later, you'll betray the people. And so, uh, you know, the work and the motivation which, which you know, builds us in this work, that, that is not something that's nuanced to me. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, my parents made the decision to move uh, when I was five years old. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. My father had a case that lasted for two years in New York. Uh, and at the conclusion of that case, my parents made the conscious decision to move to Mississippi, not because we had any relatives here, not because I had a, a great aunt or, or grandparents here, but because they believed that we had unfinished business work that needed to be done here that my father had started in the seventies. And so they gave their most precious resource to that. Uh, they gave their family to it. They didn't feel that they could shield my sister and I. Uh, from from the work. They didn't feel that they can shield us from the movement. And so just as important as giving us food, water, and shelter, they gave us this sense of community and, and the responsibility that we have to it. And so selfishly, selfishly for me, uh, because my parents were so married to that and committed to that, uh, both of them who have now uh, passed on, this is my way of keeping them alive. It's very beautiful. 
Um, so uh, question from Jose on YouTube. I think we have time for a few more. Um, what is your most radical policy goal as mayor? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, um, to take over uh, a self-determined economy, uh, an economy which, which we see worker-owned cooperatives uh, that control the economy and, and are able to uh, make the demands on, on where we go as a city. Uh, I think that that is ultimately what it leads to because so many of the ill effects we see in community are related to uh, economic insecurity, uh, the fact that we don't have economic justice. Uh, and I think that, that everything, that many things are a byproduct of that. Great. Um, I'm going to do like the Supreme Court. I'm going to consolidate a couple of similar questions. Um, so that's from one from Andy and one from uh, Spencer on YouTube. And that is, um, what is the hardest thing about governing? And, and what is like, if you could just like, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about our political system, like, what would it be? <laughs> well, you know, I think that uh, we could do more uh, to democratize power. Uh, you know, first of all, we have to realize how age old the, the concept of democracy is. Uh, you know, I would suggest a book called Facing Mount Kenya, uh, written by Jomo Kenyatta, and it talks about the Kukuru Nation uh, and how, you know, uh, tribe elders from different tribes would come together uh, to, to, you know, discuss the issues of the, the day and that they would struggle for consensus. Uh, you know, I think that we put profits over people as a country, uh, often making decisions to starve people uh, because it isn't economically feasible. Uh, and then I, I think we have to get to the place where we understand that most people aren't afraid of change. Most people are afraid of loss. And so we need to draft a narrative which speaks to our collective gain as opposed to you know robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, type of analysis that, that people often push back on. Uh, but I think that, that we have to change our economic structure. Uh, and I think that we're seeing today, uh, when we look at COVID-19, we're seeing the ill effects of that. Uh, there's very little difference between a country that, that lacks the medical advancement to take care of its people and a nation which has all of the medical uh, resources that it needs to, but it chooses not to uh, because it's not economically advantageous. Uh, the fact that people are without health care today uh, is you know, it's is criminal, it's criminal uh, that we're watching people dying from underlying health conditions because we have for so long failed to give them the resources uh, that they need to sustain their lives and to protect themselves. People are not only fighting for access to capital, people are fighting for access to live in this country. Yeah, very true. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take a question from Julius Rhodes from LinkedIn um, and that's, can you share the importance of collaboration, understanding others and developing a multicultural point of view that incorporates diverse perspectives and reaching decisions that move us forward? Uh, one, 100%, you know, I, I think that if we're not looking at it from a multicultural standpoint, then we're not truly trying to look at the issue uh, as a comprehensive view of what our community looks like and needs. Uh, you know, often we get caught up in reductive discussions uh, that, that don't lead to progress for any of us. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, we get caught up in discussions about immigration and, and, you know, people taking jobs. My vantage point, my view of that is if, if it was your job, no one could take it in the first place. Uh, and instead, we should be looking at the companies that profit off the exploitation of our people uh, and look at how we join our forces together uh, to demand better work conditions and better wages in, in our society. Uh, instead of being uh, pit against one another, uh, that that's ultimately, and I just chose one issue. I know that that you know a multicultural uh, and diverse discussion is more than just a discussion on immigration, but I just use that as an example. My view is whether your ancestors arrived on the Mayflower or they got here more recently, you deserve the same human rights uh, and the same the same response and and quality of life that we all deserve. Great. Um... So I think we have time for, for, for one more question here. Um, this is gonna be another where I, I take a couple of pretty similar questions here and meld them into one. Um, so Eric on YouTube and then Connie on YouTube have, have a pretty similar question. Um, and that is, as you're coming from an activist background, um, what is your advice for, for folks in this 
generation, um, young people today, um, in, in terms of protests and demonstrations and organizing and just kind of, I guess, general, you know, advice for, for how to make change. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, that, that we don't leave this moment having merely expressed that we're mad. Uh, that we have some very specific aims and initiatives that we want to see. Uh, I think if you look at this from a historic standpoint, a historical standpoint, uh, you know, after the death of King, it, it wasn't necessarily that people just, you know, felt the weight of, of his death and decided to, to see change. It was because people started to demonstrate in the streets of 28 cities and it forced the recognition of the country uh, to, to pass legislation. And so we have to be prepared to do the same. And I think that uh, Professor Ruha Benjamin uh, sums it up the best when she says that we must not only dismantle the world we don't want to live in, we have to be the most active participants in building the one that we do want to live in. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's what I challenge young people to do. Uh, I think that this is a generation of disruption. Uh, and I think that's a beautiful thing. We need to disrupt the status quo and move from being the governed to the governors of our destiny. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this point in history. Uh, it is a very uh, scary moment in some ways, uh, but, but we will all remember uh, this, this period of, of time and we need to make sure that we're on the right side of history uh, as we continue to push for uh, positive, progressive change in this country. Well, thank you, Shokwe. That's a great place to end, an inspirational place to end. Um, and I want to thank you once again so, so much for, for joining us here today and taking time out of your schedule to share these incredible insights with our community. Um, yeah, before, before we go, everybody, please um, join us tomorrow as the American Dream Reconsidered Conference continues. Um, so tomorrow, Tuesday, September 15th at 1230, um, we have an event uh, called Champions for Democracy, Black Women and the Right to Vote. Uh, with our moderator, Sandra Frank of Roosevelt University and panelists, Professor Martha Jones of Johns Hopkins and Professor Lisa Matterson of the University of California, Davis. Um, I'm really excited about that and I hope that you will join us for that too. Thanks to our audience for the wonderful questions um, and, uh, and for being part of this uh, really unique event, making the best of uh, broadcasting from our basements. So um, thank you so, so much. Thank you.